Your next question is going to be, uh, what do I think about you? What should you do? Well, hello, Dr. Joe here of the drjoe.com and the 2020 from.com. So, um, there's been a lot of uproar in the media about this stuff here. This is a Ruth Retour uh, natural sweetener. And uh, it's because of a new piece of research that uh, was published recently, uh, sort of associating a Ruth Retour with heart attacks and strokes. And uh, you guys know that I've always recommended uh, a Ruth Retour. In fact, it's one of my best sweeteners, I have to say. And um, some of you got in touch with me uh, asking for my opinion on this very study. And uh, so that is what this video is about. I'm going to dissect this uh, very study, all of it. And then more importantly, I'm going to give you my opinion as well. So we've got a lot to get through. Let's get started. So we're going to be looking at this erythritol study, have an update on it. And what I plan to do in this very presentation is give you a detailed anatomy of uh, what this study was all about. This study that is discussing a lot of waves in the media. So uh, what's this study about? Well, for every study, you have to have a study objective. And for this very study, the authors wanted to find out, they wanted to answer the question, are there natural or pharmacological agents that may cause heart attacks and strokes that we're not aware of? Very nice objective. I want to know whether there are hidden factors uh, that may be responsible for heart attacks and strokes uh, that uh, we're not quite aware of, even if they are natural. Okay, so uh, very good objective. And what you need to know, too, is that uh, this study, it was very detailed and it was done in four steps. And I'm going to go through all the steps with you, breaking it down step by step, if you like. So what happened in step one? Well, in step one, the study authors enlisted 1,157 people undergoing cardiac risk assessment over a three-year period. What else did they do in step one? Well, they checked their blood for multiple small molecules that are called metabolomics, and that includes uh, sugar alcohol. Now, erythritol is a sugar alcohol sweetener. Uh, we like them, we like the sugar alcohol sweeteners because they don't spike our blood sugar levels when we use them, and they don't stimulate insulin secretion as well. So that's why we like them. However, is it possible that these sugar alcohols may be causing problems in the background that we're not aware of? Uh, so uh, this study will be looking at that. So what else did they do in step one? Where they matched the blood levels of the small molecules with major cardiac events. And by major cardiac events, I'm referring to things like death, heart attacks, and strokes. And the idea behind matching the blood levels of the small molecules with major cardiac events was to look for a correlation between the blood levels and these major cardiac events like death, heart attacks, and strokes. Good so far. Very nice plan. So the next thing they did uh, was that they teased out the offending molecules that correlate with the major cardiac events. Uh, like I said, they're looking for a correlation. And from the correlation, they sort of uh, figured out, uh, they profiled the small molecules and looked for the ones that really correlated more with major cardiac events. So what were their results? Well, the first thing you need to know uh, from the results of step one is that the search for these offending molecules was untargeted. Okay, This is like throwing your fishing net into the sea and seeing how many fish you're going to catch uh, in the net. And of course, if you throw your net into the sea, uh, you're probably going to catch a lot of fish. Anyway, um, what they then did was, having caught a lot of fish, uh, they analyzed them and uh, erythritol came out on top of the offending molecules in the blood of people who had heart attacks, strokes, and even death. So you throw out your fishing net, caught a lot of offending molecules, and then you analyze them with a view to finding out the one that offended the most, the one that correlated the most. So uh, erythritol was the one that correlated the most. So um, for the study authors, this step one uh, was a discovery cohort. That is to say, okay, we've thrown out the fishing net, we've caught a lot of fish, 
uh, we've uh, caught a restrictor as the one that offended the most. Uh, so we're in business, basically. And that's why it's called a discovery cohort. Now, you also need to remember, though, that uh, whatever they found was a correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean that the erythritol was the cause of the cardiac event. It simply means that high erythritol levels correlated with major cardiac events. Okay, so they moved on to step two. So that is step one concluded. They moved on to step two. What did they do in step two? Well, this time around, uh, the search uh, for the offending molecules was a lot more targeted. Uh, what they did was they looked out for these offending molecules in the blood of patients undergoing cardiac evaluation. And the search for these offending molecules occurred on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean over a three-year period. So in the US, they recruited 2,149 participants, and in Europe, 833 study participants. And uh, what did they find in step two? Well, again, a erythritol showed up, okay? Erythritol was correlating with major cardiac events. What that means is that the higher the amount of erythritol you had in your blood, the higher your risk of having a heart attack or stroke, okay? Again, I should point out that this was a correlation, not a cause, okay? It simply meant if you had high levels of erythritol in your blood, that correlated with you having a heart attack or a stroke. It doesn't establish that erythritol was the cause of the heart attack or stroke. Make sense? Now, one of the things uh, that I like about the study was the study authors adjusted for factors such as diabetes, smoking, blood lipids, age, sex and systolic blood pressure good now if you talk to uh, researchers they will probably admit to you that adjustment is never perfect okay you have to do it but it's never perfect good so they moved on to step three so now that they have a theory they wanted to have a proof or concept this time around in step three so they started off with a laboratory proof and what did they do in the lab? Well, they mixed erythritol with platelets in test tubes and wanted to find out if that triggered clotting of the blood. So what happened? Well, they mixed the erythritol with the platelets. And of course, uh, what do you know? Uh, clotting occurred in the test tubes. Now, a little caution here because uh, the clotting that occurred was dose-dependent, meaning the more erythritol you had in the test tube, uh, the higher the tendency for the platelets to stick together uh, to provoke a clot. Okay, but this was 3A, laboratory proof. Then they moved on to 3B, animal proof. And what happened in the animal proof model? Well, they injected mice with a erythritol and wanted to see whether that would trigger blood clotting. And what do you know? Well, blood clotting actually occurred. Okay, blood clotting was triggered when uh, erythritol was injected into the mice. Now, another word of caution here is that the doses of the erythritol that were injected into the mice were quite high, okay? So uh, that's uh, something to uh, bear in mind. So in step three, you had laboratory proof, which progressed to animal proof. Now let's move on to step four, which was human proof. What did they do in step four? Well, they gave eight healthy study participants a 30 gram erythritol drink and then measured their blood erythritol levels. Obviously, if you give somebody erythritol, if you have it in your smoothie, uh, if you have it in your tea or your coffee, uh, your blood levels of erythritol, they're gonna rise. Anyway, they gave them 30 gram erythritol drink, measured their blood erythritol levels, and what did they find? Well, they found that uh, blood levels of erythritol spiked quite high and it remained high for two days. And what they also found was the spike of the erythritol exceeded the threshold that was required for the platelets to stick together and provoke clot formation. So uh, this for them was a bit of a concern. And for the study authors, for them, this was the proof they needed that 
high erythritol levels thus correlate with platelet stickiness that leads to clot formation. So, um, is that the end of the story? Maybe not. So that's the study. What's my opinion on the conclusions from this very study? The first thing I want to point out is that the study cannot really establish that dietary erythritol was responsible for the heart attacks and strokes. It really can't. Because for a start, this study was started in 2004 and lasted till 2011 before erythritol use became popular, meaning the contribution from dietary erythritol was probably quite minimal uh, in the outcome that uh, uh, they found in this very study. And by the way, I'm referring to dietary erythritol. Another thing you should know is that our body actually makes erythritol from a metabolic pathway. Okay, we make it anyway. What that means is that it's going to be difficult, even for the study authors, to disentangle the effect of endogenous erythritol, which is one that we make inside our body from the metabolic pathway. It's going to be difficult to disentangle that from exogenous erythritol, which is the one that we consume in our diet. And you really, really have to be very, very, very clever uh, to be able to deal with this confounder. Okay, so uh, that is uh, the first thing that I want to say about uh, this very study. And in fact, the study authors, they did admit that they didn't collect data from study participants on their dietary erythritol consumption. So in the absence of that, we don't know what the contribution from dietary erythritol was. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I want to talk about is uh, that metabolic dysregulation and chronic inflammation in the body does lead to increased erythritol production in the body, okay? And that also includes a cardiac event in itself. If you take the blood of an individual uh, who's had a cardiac event and the erythritol levels are high, how do you know that the level of the erythritol that you're looking at is not because of the cardiac event in itself or the fact that the individual has always had chronic inflammation anyway? So that's another confounder that is going to be difficult for us to uh, uh, disentangle. So that's the second thing. The third thing I want to say is that uh, the dose of the erythritol that was used in this very study, the 30 grams of the erythritol, is not a practical consumption level for a lot of people. Uh, you know, 30 grams equates to 7.5 teaspoons of erythritol daily. I don't know how many people are using that amount of erythritol, uh, for them to exceed the threshold that is required for clotting to, uh, to occur in the body. So, because I know a lot of people who use erythritol, they probably use one teaspoon, two teaspoons, or even three in a day, nowhere near the 30 grams or the seven and a half teaspoons that uh, the study authors are talking about. So for me, this is another issue that puts the study findings uh, into question, if you like. Now, if you're wondering what the force is all about, well, this is a study. Uh, it was published in Nature Medicine with uh, the title, The Artificial Sweetener Erythritol and Cardiovascular Event Risk. So there you go. Uh, those are the findings and uh, those are my opinion as well. Now, am I going to stop using erythritol on the basis of uh, this very study? Well, not really. Uh, in any case, I don't use huge amounts anyway. I certainly don't use the amount they're talking about, the 30 grams a day. Uh, so uh, it, it really doesn't bother me much in terms of uh, the association between erythritol and the risk of heart attacks and strokes that uh, the study is talking about. So, your next question is going to be, uh, what do I think about you? What should you do? Well, that will be up to you. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable uh, continuing to use your erythritol on the basis of the study findings, go ahead, stop using it. It's as simple as that. I'm not going to encourage you to use it. I'm just telling you about the fact that it's not going to stop me from using uh, erythritol. Now, in another video, I'm going to talk to you about uh, erythritol alternatives for those of you who might be worried that you don't want to continue using it. I'm going to give you some more alternatives that you can uh, start using uh, in place of erythritol. But personally, um, I'm not going to stop using it because I don't use heavy amounts. In fact, uh, for any of you who wishes to continue using it, all I would say is less is more, okay? Uh, because if you're using very little, uh, then there's really not much to worry about, in my opinion anyway. 
Uh, so uh, that's uh, my conclusion regarding uh, this uh, very uh, study that's caused a lot of uproar in the media and everybody's shouting about the root tour and heart attacks and strokes. So hopefully you got some value from this very video. If you did, uh, please uh, give the video a thumbs up. Uh, please uh, share this video with your friends, your family and your colleagues. Uh, you got any questions, any comments regarding the content of this video presentation? Go ahead, leave your comments or questions down below. I think that's about it. Until next time, well, this is Dr. Joe signing out.